I, I guess speaker was up front. Oh, he's back. He scared me. <laughs> uh, Lewis Torres Jr. from the University of Florida, working on his PhD. Going to talk tonight about Sabercats, which everybody's excited about. I hope the new people learn tonight you don't say Sabertooth Tiger anymore for many, many years. So, welcome. He's very enthusiastic, so I'm going to turn the microphone over to him. There you go. I'm going to turn half the house lights down for you, too. Sounds good. Yeah. All right, is this good for everybody? Yeah. Well, hello everyone, my name is Louis Torres Jr. I'm a uh, PhD student from the University of Florida and also an invertebrate paleontologist from the Florida Museum of Natural History, which means I essentially study animals that don't have any bones. I didn't know that saber tooth cats didn't have any bones. <laughs> <laughs> well, it turns out, guys, uh, during my master's degree, I actually had quite a lot of uh, interest in vertebrates, right? And I tried my best to get into a vertebrate paleontology program. Uh, but I also really liked invertebrates as well, and that's the one I eventually ended up getting into. And I really give talks about all sorts of different groups of animals, right? I have a lot of colleagues that study saber tooth cats and all sorts of different vertebrates, so I try to stay up to date on the research. And honestly, saber tooth cats are probably one of my favorite groups of animals pretty much of all time, right? And I'm sure a lot of you would agree with me, right? And so, essentially what we're going to be talking about today, we're going to be talking about different types of saber tooth cats and who they're most related to, so essentially their taxonomy. Uh, but we're also going to be talking about their ecology. And so essentially what they hunted, how they hunted, right, where they lived, and whether they were social or not, sort of covers the main sort of subjects we're going to be talking about today. And so, without further ado, we're going to go ahead and start. Before we get into saber tooth cats, and you know, just them, we're gonna be talking about the cat family or felidae as a whole. And there's actually three main sort of subfamilies of cats, right? You have the pantherines, which are sort of your big cats. Think your lions, your tigers, your jaguars, everything else like that. But also your small cats, the felidae or the felines. And this includes, of course, your house cats, your lynx, so your bobcats, and your Asian lynx and everything like that. But also your cheetahs and pumas. And you might be thinking, hold on a second, Lewis. Cheetahs and pumas are over 80 pounds, or anywhere from 80 to 200 pounds. Why the heck are they in the small cat group? Well, it just turns out that cheetahs and pumas are actually just really big small cats, right? <laughs> and that actually, part of the reason we actually differentiate them and put them in the small cat family, there's a lot of anatomical differences, uh, but a sort of informal difference you can think is that, you know, cheetahs and pumas don't really roar, okay? Whereas your large cats, such as your lions and tigers and jaguars, have a different sort of structure in their vocal cords that allow them to make this sort of deep basal roar. And that's, you know, the anatomy itself is scientific, but the whole not being able to roar thing for the small cats is a little bit less so, right? It just makes it a little bit easier to sort of describe, hey, this is why cheetahs and pumas aren't considered big cats, even though they're very large small cats, right? And then of course, your third subfamily are the Macarodontinae, so Macarodontinae. And the Macarodontinae actually means sword tooth or knife tooth, right? And so it's just kind of funny that Saber cats, their subfamily name, is just means saber tooth, right? And you can actually break up the saber tooth uh, subfamily, the Macarodontine subfamily, into three main groups. The dirt tooth cats, uh, otherwise known as the Smilodontini, right? These are your usually really thick and hefty cats with the really long canine teeth, think anywhere from seven to 11 inches long, and some of the biggest species. Uh, and usually they're more heavily built with shorter, stouter legs. Whereas your scimitar tooth cats, one of the other uh, sort of groups within the subfamily, uh, typically have shorter canine teeth, still quite a bit longer than most of your modern cats that you see today, most of the conical tooth cats. Uh, and they're typically a little bit longer and leaner with longer legs, a little bit more like a lion sort of build. All right? And lions are still pretty beefy animals, but compared to the dirt tooth cats, right, they are quote unquote lean. Right. And then the last sub, uh, this last tribe, technically, uh, is the Metallurini. There's been some debate as to whether the Metallurines are actually saber tooth cats or whether they're convergent with saber tooth cats and they're actually in the big cat group, the Pantherinae family. Uh, so we're not really, or subfamily, excuse me, we're actually not really going to be talking about the Metallurini all that much. Right. So we're mostly going to be focusing on two most famous tribes, the dirt tooth cats and the scimitar tooth cats. And the names Smilodontini and Homotherini, these scientific names for dark tooth cats and similar tooth cats, are actually sort of based on the two most famous genera of the group. All right, on the left here you see Smilodon, which is your quintessential saber tooth cat, right? If you're seeing a saber tooth cat in media, 
99% of the time, it's going to be Smilodon. All right, this is the animal that has three main species here in North America, Gracilis, which is around 300 pounds, Fatalis, uh, which is around 600 pounds, and in South America, you get the biggest cat that's you know ever been on record, at least that has a wild breeding population, so ligers don't count, okay guys? Uh, Smilodon populator, which reached over 960 pounds. Now we have to keep in mind, okay, that the largest individuals we find in the fossil record do not mean that that is as big as they could get. All right, think of everybody in this room. Does any, is anybody the size of Shaquille O'Neal? <laughs> right, exactly. So if everybody got buried on the earth, right, and given the chance that not everybody's gonna fossilize, the chance of finding Shaquille O'Neal's bones is incredibly rare. All right, whereas they're more likely to get you know, your average size individual, which I reckon most of us are. I haven't seen anybody that's, I believe, above 6'4", so. If I'm wrong, please correct me. And so, if you take a look here, this is a uh, sort of family tree. I made very simplified family tree, okay? I don't wanna be here for three hours talking about every single type of saber tooth cat. We will be talking about them a little bit, at least. Uh, but you can see, at the bottom here, the x-axis, I think everybody can see it, we got millions of years, starting back from the dinosaur extinction around 66 million years ago, all the way to common era, which is essentially just a fancy scientific word for modern day. And you really see that uh, first uh, sort of cat relatives, or not the first, but really the more recognizable cat relatives are the carnivorans. Carnivorans really started showing up around 60 million years ago. They, of course, evolved from animals that were around during the dinosaur age, but we're just starting with the carnivorans here. And then they really split into two main groups a little bit before 55 million years ago. The caniforms, which includes your dogs, your uh, bears, your seals, sort of anything that's more related to a dog than a cat is gonna be a caniform. And vice versa, we also get the feliforms, the cats, hyenas, mongooses, etc. And you get your first cat around 25 million years ago, Macarodontinae, the saber-toothed cats, split off a little bit before 20 million years ago. And then you have the scimitar tooth cats and the dirt tooth cats splitting off a little bit before uh, a little bit before 10 million years ago. And so <clears throat> now I've got to put that arrow there. So here. In case you couldn't figure it out. Now, one of the big differences between saber tooth cats and uh, modern conical tooth cats really has to do with not only their tooth shape but also their skull shape. If you take a look here, the zygomatic arches or the cheekbones, okay, are much, much wider in modern conical tooth cats, right, than they are in saber tooth cats. And the reason for this, okay, is that with the incredibly long teeth we see in a lot of saber tooth cats, they actually need to be open to open their jaws much wider, right, than modern conical tooth cats have to. So in order to sort of reorganize the muscles you see in, you know, the skulls of these animals, they actually had to sort of shorten the width of the zygomatic arches. And this gives them a quote unquote weaker bite force, but that's really only when you take into account the um, sort of uh, the lower jaw, the strength of the lower jaw, right? When in reality, the same two cats would have used their neck muscles as well to puncture through, right, uh, the real thick tissue. Now, of course, the reason they're called saber tooth cats, a lot of people, I've seen a lot of really bad reconstructions of saber tooth cat skulls where you just take a tiger's teeth and you lengthen it to about three times the size. Uh, it's actually a completely different tooth shape. And if you want to know if someone doesn't know what they're talking about, uh, when they show you a skull of a saber tooth cat, all right, that's what you look for. You look for the really, really long tiger teeth. When in reality, if you look at a side profile, you can see that saber tooth cat teeth, the reason they're called saber tooth cats is because the sabers are kind of sore. Their teeth are blade shaped, right? And I sort of compare this to a, you know, the knife like teeth of, funny enough, Smilodon also means knife tooth, right? Of Smilodon, they have knife-like teeth, uh, or scimitar, or saber tooth cats in general, excuse me. Whereas the more modern conical tooth cats have teeth more so like a ice pick, right? Modern conical tooth cats kill most of their prey through asphyxiation. And essentially what that means is they bite onto the throat and they essentially hold that pressure, hold that pressure, hold that pressure until the animal passes out. That's why you'll typically see animals like lions and tigers going for not just the throat, also the snout, depending on, you know, the situation at hand. Now, that's why, you know, the teeth are a little bit more even when it comes to their shape, right? They're a little bit more equal in the width from side to side and front to back. Because if you have to keep that pressure on, all right, your teeth need to be able to resist breakage, right? Because if your teeth break, 
you're going to have a heck of a hard time killing anything else. All right. Whereas the saber-toothed cats, the reason why they have this sort of uh, knife-like shape, sure, it makes it a lot easier for those teeth to break, but they don't have to sit there and hold that pressure. What they do, that's why a lot of dirt tooth cats, because they have extremely long teeth, they're more muscularly built. Because they need to make sure their prey is not struggling around, right? And it decreases the risk of them breaking their teeth, okay? And this thin, like, uh, knife-like shape in their teeth allows them to puncture through the thick skin and muscle of larger prey much easier, right, than your clonical tooth cats. A saber tooth cat can bite through the neck or the throat of a bison or something like that. It cuts through the carotid arteries, it cuts through the windpipe. Your animal's not going to be breathing a whole lot if your windpipe is bisected, right? And so that's sort of, while it's more efficient, it does have that inherent risk of, you know, being able to break easier if they cannot get that prey stabilized, okay? Now, as far as the killing bite goes, I kind of just talked about the way that saber tooth cats uh, typically use their teeth, especially the dirt tooth cats, right? Because they have the longer teeth than scimitar tooth cats, they're more, they can sort of get in through the thick skin and thick muscle much easier than other types of uh, saber tooth cats can. And so, you know, on their way in, they can really sort of slice through all that real precious stuff you have in the throat. Now, another kind of bite that's been suggested by some paleontologists, instead of just the, I'm gonna bite, let go, and everything in your neck is shredded, is some people suggest that as they're biting through the throat, the teeth are actually slicing, right, a chunk of meat out of the throat at the same time, instead of just puncturing. And then what happens is they'll then grab this chunk of meat with their massive sort of incisors, which are the front teeth in between the canines, and use their bulk to do a push-up motion and pull the throat right off the animal. Uh, I am a little skeptical of this just because it puts a ton of stress on the teeth, but I suppose if you're really trying to kill an animal quickly, uh, as in within a few seconds, pulling its throat out is probably one of the best ways to do it, right? And rarely do predators use one specific strategy when hunting, so I suppose it is possible that they might have pulled the throat out of something uh, at some point in history, right? Now, the scimitar tooth cats could have also done a sort of puncture throat bite, right? Uh, the only thing is that te their teeth are significantly shorter, so they really would have done this uh, with smaller prey animals, right? Something maybe not quite buffalo-sized, um, but I do believe that they would have been more likely to do the canine shear bite because their teeth are shorter, right? They're less likely to break than what we see with the dirt tooth cats. And they also have abs even bigger incisors, you know, for their body size than what we see with dirt tooth cats, all right? And some animals like Xenosmilus, also known as the cookie cutter cat, it's believed that biting chunks out of prey animals was actually one of their main ways of hunting. And then of course, if it is going after really large prey like Homotherium, I'll talk about this a little bit more later. Homotherium is one of the saber tooth cats that are most renowned for going after baby mammoths, right? If exceptionally large prey like that, they probably would sort of do the same compression bite that we see with a lot of the conical tooth cats. And so here's another sort of view, a better view of the front, uh, the front profile and the side profile of these saber tooth cats. Now, the true saber tooth cats weren't the only saber tooth predators in the Cenozoic. You also had saber tooth uh, predators from their relatives, the Feliforms. And as I mentioned earlier, the feliforms are really any sort of animal that's more closely related to a cat than a dog. This includes, of course, cats themselves, unsurprisingly, uh, but also hyenas, binturongs, which are called bear cats. Uh, it's kind of funny, if you ever see them at the zoo, right, they actually smell like Fritos. And so that's really, really funny, and they're absolutely adorable. Uh, and then also mongooses. And then there's also an animal that looks very cat-like all the way at the top there, but is still not considered a cat. Some of you guys might uh, recognize this animal from the movie Madagascar. It's a kid's movie, the fossa, right? And they're a sort of, yeah, fossa, exactly, right? And they look it's very similar to cats, but they're just inside the cat group, and they are actually the predominant large carnivore in Madagascar, right? So they are uh, pretty much the lemurs pain, right? Lemurs are not fans of these guys, I'll tell you that much. So, <clears throat> These feliforms, uh, before true cats started showing around, actually sort of developed this very similar body plan and tooth structure to the saber tooth cats. As you can see here on the bottom left, you've got Barbophilus, and then you have an in-rabbit Hoplophonius in the top right there. Barbophilus could get around 500 pounds or so, whereas your Hoplophonius was a uh, 300 pound animal, 
Okay, so these are decently sized. And the reason we believe that these animals are actually uh, have such a similar body shape is due to something called parallel or convergent evolution. Essentially, when two groups of animals develop uh, similar structures that their common ancestor did not have, right? Uh, this is what is known as convergent evolution. Because these traits are good for this sort of niche, right? They will develop similar traits. And so you can sort of hear, see here the Nimravids, Bartophilids, the false saber tooth cats diverged much, much earlier uh, before we even get the first two cats, and they ended up lasting until close to the end of the uh, beginning of the Pliocene. Now, when we talk about the first true cat, we got Crowellurus. Crowellurus, as you can see, I mean, kind of looks like a cat if you squint hard enough. It looks very, very similar to a fossil, which just sort of shows that the fossil shape is sort of almost a primitive condition for a lot of the, uh, at least the later feliforms. And they really started first showing up around 25 million years ago, but would then later give rise to what I call the granddaddy of all cats, Sunaelurus. And Sunaelurus is really the first cat-like cat. And in fact, the largest of the Sunaelurus species uh, actually had slightly elongated teeth, right? And we actually believe that Sunaelurus quadridentatus, hey, I said that right. First time I think I've done that. Uh, <laughs> is actually thought to be the direct saber cat ancestor, or at least uh, to common knowledge. Now, coming back to uh, the true saber tooth cats, all right, the first, the earliest true saber tooth cats that we know of, uh, we actually found in Spain. And I forget the exact name of the, uh, of the formation in which they're found, but you know, they're around 11 million years old. And the reason I have a question mark around Paramachiotis here which is supposedly a dirt-tooth cat, is because the ages for this animal is not 100% set in stone. Uh, I know there was a lot of issues with the dating with the, of, the, of these fossils, um, and so I wouldn't necessarily trust this 15 million years uh, for a pair of cats here. And it's also possible it may just be called Megantarium. I know there's still debate on that. So really, you can kind of just ignore this guy here. And so Chrome Megantarium was the first true dirt-tooth cat around 11 million years ago and was sort of had a more leopard-like niche, all right? It was around 150 pounds or so, uh, and was sort of played second fiddle to another animal that showed its, uh, or that shared its environment, Machiridus. And Machiridus is probably one of the most successful large cats, or saber-toothed cats of all time, existing for almost 11 and a half million years, which is absolutely absurd for a single genus, right? And Macarus, as you can see on the top left here, uh, sort of filled that with pro was the leopard, right? Macarus was the sort of lion of its ecosystem. Okay, and it was for quite a long time. Now, if we continue along the, uh, the dirt tooth cat sort of uh, lineage, we then get Megantarium. Meg if Smilodon is sort of the grand, or not the granddaddy, the king of all saber tooth cats, right? Then Megantarium, I would say, is the rook, right? Megantarion is an incredibly well-known animal and actually thought to be a sort of direct ancestor to Smilodon. And although it was quite a bit smaller, it was also incredibly successful. This animal would have been around 300 pounds. And as you can see, if you show these two skulls to most people, they would have a hard time being able to tell which one was Megantarion and which one was Smilodon. One way you can tell is that these sort of protrusions off the mandible here are much bigger than, uh, in Megantarion than what we see in Smilodon. And of course, the first uh, remains we get of this animal are from Africa around 7 million years ago. But a few million years after the fact, it's believed that they also existed in North America and Eurasia. And so this animal was around for around 400,000 years and seemed that it went extinct in Africa. And so this just sort of shows that this animal was probably the most dominant on that continent. Now another saber-toothed cat, right, that's actually special just to Florida is Rhizosmilodon. Okay, and Rhizosmilodon is another animal that's about leopard size, around 165 uh, pounds, and existed around five million years ago. And it's sort of thought to be a cousin of Megantarion. It's not really thought to be in the same sort of lineage, per se. They are still dirt-toothed cats, but it's sort, uh, sort of thought to be sort of an offshoot. Okay, and this animal was actually originally described as Megantarion, but was redescribed back in 2013. Yes. Well, you just named after Super Spring. Oh, that's right. <laughs> uh, who is that? Oh, yeah, that's right. I think you even told me about that, <laughs> that you found this animal. 
So yeah, there you go, fun fact. Now when we talk about um, the true saber tooth cats, right, uh, everybody is sort of recognized as Smilodon, right? And Smilodon has, as I mentioned before, three main species. Brasilis was the earliest showing up around two and a half million years ago. Uh, Smilodon fatalis, a little bit later, around 1.6 million years ago. And in South America, you get populated. And so you can see sort of these three main size morphs of these saber tooth cats. And they were thought to be sort of the dominant predators of their ecosystem. Although, of course, they did have to contend with animals such as dire wolves, uh, and also animals like American lions and short-faced bears, right? Which are thought to at least rival the size of these animals. Speaking of the size, you might think that because Smilodon populator is the largest cat of all time, that dirt tooth cats sort of have the size thing in the bag. Well, it turns out most of your largest same tooth cats are scimitar tooth cats, okay? And that's, when we're talking about the, when we're looking at the top seven of the largest saber tooth cats, Number one and number seven are held by dirt tooth cats, right? Smile on populated and smile on fatalis at the bottom. Every other one, two of which are mycotiridus, which sort of leads to how successful this animal was and how dominant this animal was, are, you know, scimitar tooth cats. Okay, that's mycotiridus. I'm not even trying to say that so, uh, species name. Mycotiridus horribilis, idosmilus, amphimacotiridus, and xenosmilus, pictured here. And this right here is in the Florida Museum of Natural History. If you guys haven't sort of seen this animal uh, in real life, well, of course you haven't seen it in real life, haven't seen a skeleton at the museum, I would strongly recommend it. Now going back to the scimitar tooth cats, Mycotiridus was pretty much the most dominant uh, scimitar tooth cat through and through, uh, and is thought to be sort of the direct ancestor of a lot of other scimitar tooth cats, such as Homotherium, as we see here. And Homotherium itself was actually a incredibly incredibly successful animal, inhabiting every single continent, right, that has ever held a population of wild cats, okay? And this, of course, uh, excludes uh, Australia and Antarctica, right? Of course, there are house cats in Australia right now, uh, which unfortunately are causing a lot of problems, and I'm sure at one point someone brought their cat to Antarctica. But aside from those, right, they don't really count. Now, when we're talking about the range of Smilodon, you of course, Smilodon gracilis and fatalis are found primarily in North America, populator found in South America. And the reason I have a picture of this, um, of South America here, is you can sort of see how the range, the South American range of fatalis sort of lines up perfectly with the Andes mountain range. And this just sort of shows what significant kind of effects uh, these landforms have on the distribution and biogeography of different species of animals. Okay, and it's in fact, it's thought that uh, Populator didn't evolve directly from Fatalis, but actually was a sort of second evolution of Brasilis. So in reality, uh, current research shows that Fatalis and Populator both diverged from Brasilis, the smaller form, separately. Now, of course, I'm bringing up this picture again just to show, once again, you know, these animals have completely different body shapes. They, of course, both are sort of, you know, are cats. But the saber tooth cats or the dirt tooth cats are generally much thicker and much more powerfully built, whereas the scimitar tooth cats are a bit leaner and more built for running. And as a result, they had two different uh, hunting styles. Smilodon and other dirt tooth cats were primarily ambush predators. They needed to go out of cover, so they primarily inhabited jungles, forests, and savannas. Whereas Homotherium, being a running animal, and in fact, it actually has a larger nasal cavity and larger chest cavity to be able to then take more oxygen for distance running. It is one of the only cats to be specialized for distance running. And in fact, it actually has, uh, its claws are sort of more built like canine claws. They are meant more instead of for gripping, for being able to have a lot of traction on different types of substrate. Now, Smilodon, as far as its diet goes, of course, because it primarily inhabited forested savanna environments, would hunt animals that lived in these kinds of environments, right? That's just kind of common sense, right? But a lot of paleontologists were actually able to take a look at the carbon isotopes within the fossils of these animals. And you might ask, what exactly is a carbon isotope? Well, different elements have different forms based on the number of neutrons within their atoms, okay? And these different forms are more prevalent in some plants versus others, right? You have a different form of carbon in grasses and sort of grassland plants than you would in forests and jungles and so on and so forth. 
if you're an herbivore and you eat more one kind of plant than another, you obtain the dominant carbon from that plant or that kind of plant. And if you're a carnivore that mostly eats those kinds of herbivores, you also get that kind of carbon. Okay, and in which scientists can actually take a look at the kind of carbon within your fossils and be able to tell what kind of herbivores you ate. All right, so it's a super, super interesting field. And based on these carbon isotopes, we can actually see that, you know, most smilodons, you know, they ate peccaries, tapirs, llamas, larger species ate bison and even ground sloths. And in South America, populator even ate, you know, really large animals such as toxodon, which is a group of South American ungulates that really don't have any modern uh, sort of lineages, right? They don't have any modern descendants. And honestly, it looks very, it just looks like a really big copy of me. But somehow they're not a rodent. <laughs> it's just like, that is a really weird looking deer relative, right? And so, now when we're talking about other sort of uh, prey species, you of course get glyptodonts, which according to uh, most paleontologists today are just types of armadillos. Although some paleontologists do still say that they are armadillo relatives. I don't really have a say in the matter, right? I'm an introverted paleontologist, so I can't say, you know, what they are. Uh, I can say it, but it doesn't mean anything, right? Uh, and then, of course, you see ground sloths here. Uh, they range in size from about dog-sized or a little bit smaller all the way up to elephant-sized. 17 feet tall and multiple tons. I believe it's Megatherium is the largest. Megatherium or Aerotherium, one of the two. And then, of course, you get peccaries. Uh, peccaries are actually still alive today. They may look like pigs, but they are actually just close relatives of pigs, all right? They are really the kinds of pig relatives that existed in North America. Wild pigs and hogs are not native. They were brought by the Spaniards uh, when they first colonized North America. So, another fun fact there. Now, going back on Homo ethereum, as far as the isotope analysis goes, they ate a lot of horses, unsurprisingly. Right? And if you are a horse person, I'm sorry to tell you, uh, they were very much prey for a lot of animals back during the Ice Ages and the late Cenozoic. Right? Uh, but also, as I mentioned before, uh, Homo ethereum is one of the most successful mammoth killers probably of all time besides for humans. There is a cave uh, in Texas, I believe it's near San Antonio, could be wrong on that, called uh, Freisenhahn Cave. All right? And in this cave, they found over probably more now but over 300 different individuals of baby Columbian man, along with 30 something individual homo therium, right? And then of course they also did find one dire wolf in there, which was probably sniffing around for some meat and ran into the wrong kinds of neighbors. <laughs> so what this tells us is that this was a den for multiple generations of homo therium. We do not believe homo therium were running in 30, you know, 30, you know, wide animal packs. I have wrong word for that, and you guys know what I mean. Right? And so this probably represents two or three different generations of Homo ethereum throughout time and the 300 different calves of Columbia mammoths that they ended up hunting. And this just sort of shows how social these animals would have been. Because although Homo ethereum is a 400 pound cat, it's about lion sized, right? If mammoths are anything with like elephants, which they are technically elephants, right? The only reason we call them mammoths is because they don't live anymore, right? They're not around anymore. Um, they certainly would have protected their young with an incredible amount of ferocity, all right? And they would have been really hard to rip an elephant, or excuse me, a mammoth calf away from its herd, right? And for anybody who thinks it's easy, I dare you to go give it a try, right? Let me know what happens. <laughs> and so this tells us that Homo ethereum was almost certainly a social animal, was almost certainly hunting in packs, and even its genome, it has genes that lead it to a more social kind of lifestyle. Smilodon, on the other hand, is, well, a couple years ago, was a little bit more debated. Uh, based on what we see with the liberated tar pits, it's very much more considered to be social, although there is still some debate on that. Now, I am gonna clear up some misconceptions of the liberated tar pits. Uh, a lot of people think that it's essentially like quicksand, right? You step into some tar and you sink down until you're completely sort of covered, and then you end up drowning that way. That is actually probably a much nicer way to go than how tar pits actually worked. Now tar pits are essentially asphalt seeps, right? That sort of percolate the top of the grounds, right, the surface of the grounds, and are usually covered by a thin layer of water. This gives it a false appearance of appearing like a wetland or a lake. So you have a lot of herbivores or carnivores that would come along for a drink, you know, maybe they try to get to deeper water, so they step in it a little bit, and they step too far, they try to take another step in, they're stuck. It's like flypaper, 
or those sticky traps you leave around your house, right? These animals then become stuck on the surface, right? They, of course, are becoming dehydrated because they're unable to drink. They're becoming panicked, so they're letting out all these sort of, you know, panic calls, right? And they've actually done studies in Africa that show that predators are more likely to react to the sort of uh, the distress calls of prey animals if they are social, right? And the number one animal found in the La Brea tar pits are direwolves. An animal we are positive, almost absolutely positive, is social. What is the second most common terrestrial predator we find there? Smilodon, right? Smilodon is incredibly common. I believe they have at least 300 species, probably more or it's not 300 species, 300 different individuals in the La Brea Tar Pits, right? And so this might, you know, this led a lot of people to believe that, yeah, Smilodon were social because just like the direwolves, they were incredibly common at the La Brea Tar Pits, along with animals like coyotes. Coyotes were also in them as well. However, an animal that's even more common than say two cats is golden eagles. Golden eagles are still around today, and they are certainly not social animals. In fact, they kind of despise each other, right? If you have one golden eagle uh, that flies into the territory of another golden eagle, you better hope you're the other, <laughs> the other gender of it, right? Uh, or else you have a fight on your hands. And even then, even then, you know, if they're not in the right mood, then you know, you're still probably gonna have a fight on your hands. And so it is believed that, yeah, maybe smiling on were solitary, but they were just incredibly common like golden eagles were. The one thing I say against that is that typically animals that can fly really high have an easier time finding, right? Like, uh, you know, dead animals and stuff like that and carrion. So this could instead be a bias based on uh, animals like vultures and like golden eagles just had a much easier time finding the tar pits than animals like Smilodon. Okay, so if we go over the sort of, uh, the uh, sort of pro-social and pro-solitary sort of evidence for Smilodon being social, Right, of course, it's very common in the Brea tar pits, like diamonds and coyotes. They also have shown to be able to heal from many, many different, what would be crippling injuries to a solitary animal. There are Smilodon that have broken pelvises to where they would really not be able to run hardly at all. And it's actually been shown that in lions, in lions that have broken jaws and broken legs and everything that would keep an animal from hunting, the primates and the pack mates would actually help feed these animals so they're properly able to heal. So this acts as evidence towards them being social. And also another interesting thing, which is a little bit more recent, has it been shown that teenage Smilodon actually lived with their parents, with their mother at least, for a very, very long time. Because when you have an 11 inch long teeth, right, you have a harder time hunting by yourself until those teeth are fully grown in. And growing in those teeth takes time. So it actually has shown that although young Smilodon do grow to their teenage phase relatively quickly, they may have stayed in that teenage phase for a much longer period of time. And they could have actually helped at least their mother, if not both parents, take down animals, but not necessarily giving the killing bite. Right? So they would have maybe helped uh, the, their parents sort of be able to hold down a bison or something like that while the parent goes for the throw. Now, as far as the evidence of it being solitary, Smilodon, based on the endocasts of the brain, were pretty dumb, right? They had very small brains. Uh, but again, there is evidence, you know, it is sort of common knowledge, at least in the scientific community, that brain size is actually a very poor uh, proxy for intelligence. In fact, crows, which are known to be some of the most intelligent non-mammalian or non-ape animals on the planet, have very small brains compared to their body size, right? And it's actually due to the fact that birds actually use their brains much more efficiently than humans, or not even humans do, than mammals do, right? And so just because they do have small brains doesn't mean that they were dumb socially, they might have just been you know, less efficient in other ways. Like maybe their sense of smell wasn't as good, or you know, their sight wasn't as good, this, that, or whatever. And then again, a counterpoint to the whole, they heal from crippling injuries, jaguars and tigers, solitary animals, if they, and they've been shown that if they have been able to scavenge enough prey, right, or go after really easy prey, like say humans, uh, they are actually able to heal from these incredibly crippling injuries. Now, of course, you are more likely to heal if you are social, but it shows that it is possible to be able to heal even if you have this sort of crippling injury.
And then I already talked about the ether theorem. Now, homo theorem, uh, you can see there's very, very little evidence to show that homo theorem is solitary, other than the fact that most big cats are solitary. And I already talked about, you know, homo theorem even has genes to show it's social. They hunt in baby mammals, which would be almost impossible for a single 400 pound cat. And their leaner frame and smaller claws, because their claws are more meant for gripping substrate and being able to turn on a dime, uh, actually make it harder to be able to grapple prey by themselves. So if you have a pack backing you up, it is easier to take down these larger animals. Now, as far as the extinction of the same two cats go, right, it is a sort of very, very complicated process, but to sum it up relatively quickly, because I know we've been going for quite a while here, right, uh, so the rapid climatic changes we see at the end of the ice age, right, threw a lot of ecosystems off balance. When you have humans, modern homo sapiens come along with their pit traps and with their laterals and all sorts of different technologies, they put even greater stress on these ecosystems, especially the large prey animals. Large prey animals have a slow growth rate, a slow development rate, but also don't give us birth to as many babies, right? So the impact that humans have on these animals is much greater than say on deer or peccaries or anything else like that. And when you're a saber-toothed cat and you're mostly eating large prey, if you have decreases in large prey populations plus added competition from humans, right? Plus humans love to kill large predators, you end up with becoming ex or you end up becoming extinct, right? And whereas more versatile animals in North America, such as mountain lions, which kill anything from rodents to elk, right, are able to survive and sort of you know last until modern day. Although we're still doing our best to try to kill off most of these large predators. Now, saber-toothed cats could eventually make their comeback simply due to the fact that, well, you have the clouded leopard here. And the clouded leopard actually sort of has a morphology that's relatively similar to Sudeilorus, you remember him, right? The saber cat ancestor. Now, of course, because humans are infecting the environment, uh, affecting the environment so severely, we're probably not gonna give this animal much of a chance to diversify. And so though it is possible that this animal could develop a more uh, saber tooth cat-like morphology. Uh, it's very unlikely given the modern state of affairs. Now, you can see here, these are my more excited. Got two pages worth. And thank you guys for listening. I had a great time.